Thank you. It's so nice to see this large crowd out, such a friendly crowd, so I'm delighted to be here. You know, it was mentioned, uh, there you go, that's a little better, that's good advice. <laughs> uh, it was mentioned uh, a minute ago by Simon that 48% uh, of the American people aren't paying taxes, and a media person asked me last week, what do you think about nearly half of the people in this country not paying income taxes? And my response was, we're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> because that's been one of my goals. You know, I want to, I, I'm pretty old fashioned on some of the things like the Constitution. I still take the oath of office rather seriously. And you know, if, if we had people in Washington that only voted for bills that were constitutionally correct, we wouldn't need an income tax. You don't need all that money. We, would have, we wouldn't have the entitlement system. We wouldn't be the policemen of the world. We wouldn't be running up these debts. It would be totally impossible. So that is my ideal. That is my goal. For this reason, I don't talk a lot about uh, flat taxes and sales taxes and, and, and the different ways in fair taxes. I want a flat tax, but I want it very flat. I want a fair tax to make sure that we're not paying hardly any taxes, including not only getting rid of the income, income tax, our goal, well, actually, it should be even more easily achievable. I don't think we should have an inheritance tax at all. We should repeal that. But our problem is this government is too big. As government gets bigger, your personal liberties are diminished. There is no way you can escape it. If you deliver to the government the responsibility to take care of us, take care of the economy, and to be the policeman of the world, you can't do that without high taxation. So taxation is a symptom of what the people's appetite is for government. So for us to change what's happening in Washington, the people have to change their appetite for government. If you believe in the entitlement system, and if, we, if you believe we have to be in 130 countries and fight endless wars, you've got to have high taxation. Taxes right now are so high that they doesn't, it doesn't even pay the bills. First, we live within our means, then we borrow, can't borrow anymore, then we tax, we can't tax anymore. So then what do we do? We invent this really ridiculous idea, oh, we're short money. So let's print it. This is why the Federal Reserve System and the monetary system has to be addressed if you want to address the subject of big government. My position is loud and clear. We don't need a Federal Reserve System. We need a gold standard for our money. If we had a government that honored that, government would be limited in size because uh, if, the government, if, if the Federal Reserve couldn't print money, interest rates would go up and the Congress would have to cut back spending. It would be self-regulating. But unfortunately, we don't have that. Matter of fact, it was the leaving the gold standard in 1971, totally and completely, that convinced me of what we had embarked on. And you look at any economic chart from 1971 on, Economic growth has been diminished, unemployment problems have occurred, debts have increased, deficits each year are huge, the entitlement system is bigger than ever. So it is a result that there are no restraints. The appetite for spending just is endless, and unfortunately, we as members of Congress have been rewarded for it because the people's appetites are satisfied. But guess what? We live in a different world today. It's a different world where everybody's challenging the entitlement system. I challenge the entitlement system, but not nipping at the edges. I challenge it on principle. I do not believe entitlements are rights, and we have to get back to understanding what rights are. You have a right to your life, you have a right to your liberty. You ought to have a right to keep what you earn. But people who claim they're entitled to something does not mean they have a right to what you earn. I've talked a lot about foreign policy, and I won't talk so much about it tonight. But foreign policy is very important because there is a lot of spending in it. But there are some basic uh, principles that I think we should adhere to. I resent the fact that we go to war now not with your, without your permission. Because the Constitution is explicitly clear. 
We go to war with a declaration. The Congress gets behind it. The people get behind it. You know who the enemy is. You fight to win and you get it over with and you don't drag it out for 10 or 20 years. And the other thing I resent is the method that we go to war. We don't even ask the Congress anymore. We ask the United Nations. We go to the United Nations and get a resolution. Then we go to, then, then we go to NATO and NATO organizes. We become marching troops for NATO. I don't like that internationalism. I don't even believe we should be in the United Nations and taking orders from the United Nations. Now, we've been careless with that for a long time. Ever since World War II, we've been fighting a lot of wars and no declarations. But this last one, this Libya, is really an affront to our dignities because we went to war there with, with the president just flaunting us and saying, I don't need to talk to you, not even a token resolution. But the tragedy is, is that the Congress really hasn't stood up to the president. So the president goes to war, he says, it's no big deal. I get my orders from NATO and we're going in there and it's for all kinds of reason. But I tell you what, if we knew and understand what, understood what national, uh, national sovereignty meant, we wouldn't, rene we wouldn't succumb to this. We wouldn't allow this to happen. We would act within the confines of the Constitution. But I can look at the Constitution and the problems that we have and blame the lack of respect for the Constitution on almost everything. If we got into this mess by little respect for the Constitution, getting back to a, a dignified economy and, a, and, and common sense, why don't we just obey the Constitution once again? That would solve so many of our problems. Article 1, Section 8 lists exactly what we're allowed to do. And the things that we're not allowed to do is explicitly expressed, and they are expressed in, uh, in the um, Ninth and Tenth Amendment. So those, those powers and, and, uh, and rights that are given to the government, it, that aren't given to the government, they are left for the states. I believe very strongly that the states need to express themselves and to say that they have the responsibility. We in the states should be dealing with this and we shouldn't be uh, deferring to the federal government all the time because if you want regulations, the regulations can be local. What about education? How long have we been uh, you know, deferring to the federal government on education? For a long time, did we, did we amend the Constitution? No. We just started doing it. Did the people in the Congress say much? No, very little. But we should say something. We don't need a Department of Education. We need to take care of our schools by ourselves. Now, we, we have a lot of problems. I have a lot of goals, and some people say they're idealistic. But if you don't have ideals, you're not going to go very far, so you have to set some goals. In education, it would be much better if it was very local. Ideally, the most responsible thing would be is for parents to be responsible for the education in the local communities. That's what should be done. So. We really don't need a Department of Education. If you're looking for places to cut and nobody wants to cut anything, we could start with the Department of Education and a few other departments that we don't need. But when you look at these problems, I think it's always good to be able to opt out of the system. If you can't change it, which we won't be able to, the monetary system is a mess. People ought to have the right to opt out. Today, if you opt out of the monetary system, if you use gold and silver as legal tender, the federal government can come down and arrest you, accuse you of terrorism and counterfeiting. And yet the counterfeiters are all over at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> but I'd like to legalize, once again, your right and your constitutional right to use gold and silver as money. And then if you like the paper money, keep using it. But if you think you should use honest money, use the gold and silver. But you can do that in education as well. Yes, we have a monstrosity of a bureaucracy controlling education at the federal level, hiring thousands and thousands of bureaucrats, millions if not billions of dollars, but we always have to argue the case for opting out. That means we should never allow government to encroach upon your right to do homeschooling and private schooling. 
Also in medicine, yes, I would like to opt out uh, of Obamacare. I'd like to get rid of Obamacare. But you ought to be able to opt out of the whole system. Why can't you opt out of all government system? Why don't we stay, stay pat as Republicans for these medical savings accounts so we can put our money in, pay our own bills, get our tax deduction, and buy a major medical policy and just let the government stay out of our lives? I'd like to... I'd like to see the day where the government stays out of our lives, off our backs, and out of our wallets, and we'd all be better off if we had a government like that. So we're, we're in, in, in big trouble right now. It's financial, financial trouble, and it's explainable. It was predictable. The Austrian free market economists had predicted this for a long time, what would happen. Timing is something that is more difficult to predict. But the events are, if you print a lot of money, let me tell you, and if it's all paper, I'll, get, I'll write you a guarantee, the value of that currency is going to go down. And it's going down more rapidly now than it has in many, many years. And the real danger that we face today is the fact that we could have runaway inflation. Yes, the entitlements aren't going to be paid, and there's going to be anger and demonstrations on the street. Runaway inflation is very, very dangerous. That is a political crisis. So we need to address this subject of the deficit and the debt and the spending and all that we do because when you have chaos, what happens is people are too anxious and saying, oh, we need more government to take care of us, make us safe. Believe me, I have come to the firm conclusion that sacrificing your liberty to be more safe doesn't work. You sacrifice it, but you are never more safe. We need to protect our liberties. That's what our goal should be. One of the responsibilities of the federal government, the, one of the major responsibilities, of course, is national defense, giving us a sound currency and, uh, and an economic system that provides the opportunity and uh, the chance for you to take care of yourself. But uh, we need to reemphasize this like we have never emphasized it before. We, we have to know what we believe in. We can't say, well, we want a little bit of freedom here and a little bit of freedom here and think that's going to work. We have to know what our goal is. And the purpose of all political action, from my viewpoint, should be the protection of liberty. Not for running your life, not for running the economy. A president or a Congress does not know how to run the economy. They don't know how you should spend your money. They don't know what your, uh, your uh, spiritual values are. The government shouldn't be involved in that. So the sooner we learn that lesson, the faster we can shrink this budget and the deficit. Because if we get into a situation where there is chaos on the streets, I'm afraid too many people are going to say, well, what we want is order. Well, I'll tell you what, the best order in a free society, and the only way you can be protected, is not by having more policemen, not by having more federal agents with guns that come in who are all illegal anyway. What you need is a firm understanding and a conviction on how the Second Amendment works to protect you in a physical manner. A lot of people are discouraged, and I have discouraging news for you generally, but I tell you what, there's a lot of good news out there. And the good news is that a lot of people are paying attention to what this country is all about. What made us great? What made us prosperous? Why property rights are important? Why taxation is wrong in many ways? And people are thinking about it. The young people especially are talking about this and very interested in studying Austrian economics, studying and understanding why we shouldn't have a Federal Reserve system and why the Constitution is so important. So that is where I get my encouragement. And also, I believe that people are thinking this way because now it's down to only 7% that believe our federal government is acting within the confines of what they per are permitted to do. The very large majority are disgusted with all. They're upset and they're angry and they're looking for answers. The answers aren't strange. They're not new. I didn't invent them. But we tested them better than any other country ever. We tested them for a couple hundred years, but for the last 50 to 80 years, we have allowed it to slip. We've lost our confidence. We've lost our determination to study and understand how free markets work. And people give us a bad rap, the conservatives and the constitutionalists and Republicans. We get a bad rap because they say we don't care. We don't have any compassion. We don't care about our fellow man. And the truth is, if you are truly compassionate, 
you will always opt for the free market and freedom and property rights. Because look at history. The prosperity has always come with the greater freedom. We've had the greatest freedom and we've had the greatest prosperity. But guess what? It's going downhill. These last 10 years have been bad news for us. It's not just since 2008. It's been bad news. We haven't created any real jobs in the past 10 years and we've accumulated all this debt. So it is coming to an end. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to reinstate these values and say that we sh should not give up on this experiment? If you look at all of history, all of history, it's been, uh, it, it has been uh, occupied by dictators and authoritarians and kings and pharaohs. And yet, we had the test. And it's new. And it was wonderful. And yet we're allowing it to slip from our fingers unless we make a declaration that we do truly believe in freedom and free markets and property. That is what the goal ought to be. That is, should be everything that you do politically, is to strive for those values. Don't allow this to leave us. Don't allow us to lose this. And the opportunity is there because the need is there. You know. Four years ago, six years ago, 20 years ago, the attention for what I was talking about has been minimal. But today, there's a lot more attention. It's not so much that I give better speeches. It is, though, that there's a greater need because people are realizing the system we have today isn't working. Even those who have been on the receiving end are getting worried. How are they going to get your money if you don't have jobs and working hard to get taken care of? So there's a lot of concern. That means there's a lot of opportunities. We do have the answer. Our party has traditionally stood for these values. We have to re state those principles and stick to them because there's no reason in the world that we have to continue to go downhill. There's every reason in the world to believe that if we do the right thing, it would not take long. With our liberties, we can get on our feet in no time. If we do not restore our liberties, we are in big trouble and it may take a lot longer. So I thank you very much for coming.